The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Good evening. Definitely we are a bunch of nerds. There have been a Sunday night at eight, after 8 p.m. in the room hearing about horror stories about uh, climate effects. Uh, it's a funny story about what you mentioned, Secretary of State, because I was out of the government and I was ACI president. And in December 2003, the governor called me to her office and said, you know what, I need you to be my Secretary of State for my last year as governor. So while I was president of ACI, my last three months as president of ACI, I was also Secretary of State of Puerto Rico. It was a uh, uh, very intense three months of my life, to say the least. So we're, we are here to speak about Hurricane Maria. Uh, in, in, in my adult life, I have gone through three hurricanes in Puerto Rico. And, and always a different experience. Um, you change of age and you see things in different perspective. Hurricane Maria, I like this picture because I hate when the news and the weather channel uh, puts a dot on a hurricane. So this is how far it is. Uh, this is how close it is. It's 90 miles from Barbados, it's whatever distance it is. And we, we tend to forget that these hurricanes are a big animal. This is huge stuff. And, and people always follow where, where the center is, where the center is. And, and, uh, to give you an idea, when the hurricane haven't still landed in Puerto Rico, uh, in San Juan area, we already have 93 miles per hour winds and, and 135 miles per hour uh, gust winds. And the hurricane has even landed in Puerto Rico yet. And, and uh, unfortunately, for young engineers, um, they go to the coat and they see some forces and they, they, they try to to fit a hurricane into a small triangle that will affect the building in terms of forces. And, and I think it's very important to see a physical image of what it is. And as you can see, the, the eye of the hurricane was a huge eye. Uh, why is that important for Puerto Rico? Because the eye at that time was about 30 miles diameter, but when it hit Puerto Rico, it was 45 miles diameter. Puerto Rico's size is 100 by 35. So when the hurricane hit the island, the eye was larger than the island itself. So, so that meant that the hurricane forces will hit the whole island at one time, depending on what the final route the hurricane had. And there's uh, always the terrifying sense that of the calm that is inside the eye. Because if you're in a particular part of the island and you are on the center of the eye, you can uh, start believing that it is over and you're just in the middle of the hurricane. And then when, when the back part of the eye comes into your place, then it's the, the, the whole fury hitting uh, your, your home. The, this is the last image that we got from the hurricane, uh, officially from the San Juan Puerto Rico radar. And the reason that's the last image is because it was flown away even before uh, the hurricane hit, the eye hit the island. So that gives you an idea. The, the last measure uh, speed in San Juan because of the hurricane, and you see it's still the eye is starting to have contact on the southeast of the island. Uh, it already has 110 miles per hour sustained winds, but the measure gust winds in the San Juan airport were over 200 miles per hour. Uh, so it blew away. The, the, the radar in the, in the area. And then that was the last image we got officially uh, from Puerto Rico. And then as you can see, the nature of the beast, the, the huge uh, uh, nature of that hurricane in perspective of a small island of Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rico fits in the Bogota Valley, so that gives you an idea how, uh, how small we are. Uh, so it was um, a terrifying in, in that sense of uh, 
uh, how how big it was. I I am previous hurricanes like Hugo and, and George's. Uh, uh, in my home, I sustained uh, winds for uh, maybe an hour, an hour and a half. And for Hurricane Maria, for over five hours, we have winds at home over 120 miles per hour. And then we have another period of, of uh, still hurricane uh, uh, forces, 80 miles to 100 miles per hour for another three hours. Then after 4 p.m., there was only a tropical storm, 60 miles. So it was a piece of cake at that time. So I went out and smoked a cigar in my terrace. My wife was terrified. Are you crazy? Said, I'm happy. The house survived. The windows are still in place. So, so I was so happy. So this gives you an idea then how, how because of the large size uh, of the eye of the hurricane, how, how terrible it was for, for all the island. Doesn't matter where you were, and people, oh, the eye is not coming through my town. Doesn't matter, you know, if, if you're on the, uh, on the path of the eye, it's terrible, it's even worse, but the truth is that the U hurricane forces were, were everywhere. Um, so this is just to show you the actual path of the hurricane. Uh, once, uh, Puerto Rico has a large uh, central mountains uh, here uh, from east to west. And, and so always whenever the hurricane hits Puerto Rico, it changes direction. In this hurricane, uh, I mentioned to you before that the, there was a, a, a problem of the eye increasing in size. Just before getting to Puerto Rico, uh, uh, the hurricane decided that they wanted a, a larger eye. So a second eye started forming. And, and this is very typical for high-end hurricanes. That process of creating a new eye helped Puerto Rico uh, that the hurricane reduces its maximum speed. Before getting to Puerto Rico, the hurricane was 185 miles per hour winds, sustained winds. In the process of creating a new eye, it reduced to 155 miles per hour. The, the, worst part, the, the bad thing was that the size of the eye increased, and although the speed was lower, then, but the impact was in a much larger area, uh, the high-end uh, wind forces, because of that change in, in size. So once it hit in around Yahukoa, it hit the mountains, and uh, on this area, the town, it, it stayed for a while. It was not sure where to go, so we, we, we got a lot of damage on central area of the mountains here, and decided to go north, and then decided to go to the sea. So it gives you a, an idea of how bad it was for everyone. And this is San Juan. So all the eye was not, not through San Juan. We got what's from here to out here, strong hurricane forces in, in the island. Uh, this gives an idea of how the winds were for, for these hurricanes. The, the northern uh, eastern quadrant is much stronger than the southern western quadrant of the hurricane. So you can see, because of the darker colors, the, the, the effects uh, miles per hour uh, that would have the hurricane on, 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 the, on the area. The, the uh, southern western coast, where Ricardo Lopez, I don't know if he's, he's here, uh, the, he lives here in Cabo Rojo. But it still have 100 miles per hour winds down there, uh, but a little bit uh, less intense. So this gives more, more an idea of how, how bad it was uh, everywhere. Um, this is the, the other, uh, and the worst part of the hurricane is the water that the hurricane brings. And I, re re I mentioned to you the issue in Caguas, the hur hurricane got stuck in, in, the, in the middle there. It was 39.9 inches of water uh, in a single day. So that gives you an idea how bad it, it gets to the flooding. As a matter of fact, uh, here is the area of Tua Baja. The, the dams that are here get so full that they, happen, they have to open the floodgates of the dams. And still there were some tropical storm winds uh, and they have to, to relocate over 10,000 people because they need to open the, the floodgates. Uh, in that area, water rise six feet in about half an hour once they, once they open the gates. There was no, no other way around it. So, so it was a lot of damage, and 
and uh, in terms of the of the water. Which, in addition, here in the Oaxaca uh, Dam, because I only have half an hour, I have to limit my topics. But the Oaxaca Dam is an earth dam, and and the water channels getting out of the Oaxaca start opening, and there have to be an emergency. Uh, repairs are still sealing the process by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. There was a flooding warning for 70,000 people and that they have to be relocated. And it was a week after the hurricane. It would, you know, keep raining, it keep raining, all the tropical depressions and, and, th and things got, got bad. And uh, the, it's now under repair and people are, are back on their homes. So what were the initial challenges? And, and as engineers, we... We tend to uh, nerds here at ACI, we look at how many uh, buildings broke and stuff like that. But the nature of the hurricane, of this hurricane was so big that there, there was several other sa uh, side effects that make impossible Puerto Rico to function after the hurricane. Nothing happened. We, we were dead uh, in, in the place. First thing, 100% of the power was lost. During Hurricane Irma, uh, 90% of the electricity went off. They were able to put it back, but it was you know, kind of a, a cheap repair to get things back until they, they could fix it. Then Hurricane Maria came, and then 100% of the power was lost. This was my biggest surprise of all, because the infrastructure for, for power is it a very old infrastructure. It was built in the 50s and the 60s. But you would expect uh, mobile phone towers to be modern structures for the last 20 years. And you would say, well, the first ones were not that good, but at least the ones they put the last 10 years, they should last better. But they went down, the same as the, as the transmission power. So it was not an issue of, of getting electricity to them, but an issue that actually uh, they collapse uh, with, with the wind. So, so that's why we were stuck with our communication. To, to give you an idea, it took the governor four or five days in some, in some towns to know and speak to the mayor. So, so those, may, those towns in the central mountains, the government didn't know what, what the hell was going on in the town. They knew things were bad, but it was terrible. Then 100% the of the running water was lost. Uh, most of them uh, uh, need, need power to work. Since everything went, went off, it was terrible. But in addition to that, when there is extreme uh, rain, they have to close the filtration plants, even if they have emergency generators, because there's so much uh, dirt on the water and that uh, they cannot pump it. And so, so it was part of the problem. Then this was a real bad problem, which you never expect to happen. The, I, I show you the, the weather antenna that was blown away. The, the radars of the airport were blown away too. So there was no radar. So uh, what FAA did is what allow visual landings in San Juan for about eight or nine days, but until finally there was a military radar that was brought in. So that limited to about one plane per hour because of precautions that FAA has to take. So that limited completely the amount of uh, aid that could be flown in or personal, military personnel, et cetera. Uh, about two weeks into the process after the hurricane, they oper opened two additional airports. They brought that radar. So all military equipment and, and emergency repair equipment for the power is being, is being uh, landed in, in, in two auxiliary airports that then they don't affect the regular traffic of the international airport in San Juan. The, the other thing is that the, all roads were blocked. And when I say all roads, I mean all roads. Uh, my, my front street, my, the entrance street to where I live, the roads are on the park where I live, which take me to my home. They were filled with trees. They, they, they were flattening out. Uh, Commander, Lieutenant General uh, Buchanan, that was appointed about two weeks after the hurricane to be in charge of the military operation, to me, I think, gave the best description. Uh, he talked, I have been in Harvey and other disasters, but in Puerto Rico, it looks like an atomic bomb hit the island and everything is flattened. So that's basically what happened with the, with the trees. 
Uh, so the, the roads were blocked and uh, preventing the access to the remote areas and preventing to get uh, the distribution of goods out on the island. The government had contracts with uh, general contractors in Puerto Rico before the hurricane for cleaning up the expressways and the main arteries of the island. But basically, the rest of the roads were opened by their own people. Neighbors, they, they, they teamed in, in packs with axes and, 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 and motor uh, chainsaws. And my, my urbanization that I live is about 500 homes. It was open uh, because of the neighbors that we, we did the job. The big problem was the electrical poles. A lot of failure, I'll show you some pictures of, of concrete poles. You, you cannot remove that with your neighbors. You know, you have to wait until the government comes. And the other then crisis that showed was that the diesel that the hospital has in reserve and the government offices was for three days. You expect, you know, an event comes and three days everything can be accessed. The truth was there was no access for several days. So um, hospitals run out of, of, of diesel. Once they run out of diesel, they could not take care of the patients. And so there was really, uh, really a big problem. O only six people died in the hurricane. We, we already have uh, another 48 that have been accounted from the hurricane and another 110 that have not been accounted for yet. But uh, uh, all people died because of they could not get dialysis or uh, people who have a blood sugar problem, they die because the insulin it rottens after two days without refrigerating. So it was a, a huge uh, effort trying to just get the medicines to the people after the hurricane. So this is the a typical avenue, how it, it, it looked after the, after the hurricane. And so it's, uh, it's not a easy, an easy uh, challenge. They, they even make this cartoon of, you remember the famous uh, raising of the American flag uh, in the war the, with the Puerto Rican flag, trying to raise the, the, the electrical system back. So it, it was really that bad. You know, so it's not an issue that a pole fell down. It was an issue of from my home to my mother's home, there's over 30 concrete poles that break. And so it took me two days to go to see my mother. That was uh, at least five minutes away from home because I, I could not do it. The, the other bad problem about the power grid is that 70% of the economy of Puerto Rico lies in a triangle like this. 70% of the economy. 90% of the power is generated on the south because of environmental reasons, blah, blah, blah. And then all these are the grid that takes the power from the south to the north. And they have to cross what? The central mountains of Puerto Rico. Where did the hurricane hit bad? In the central mountains of Puerto Rico. So all the towers are down on the lines. So it gives a, an issue that now they, they, they yesterday finally arrived to uh, a, a power plant that was going to be installed in an old powerhouse in San Juan to, to give 50 megawatts to, to, to San Juan until we can restore the power. This is a picture on July 24, and this is a picture on September 24 of Puerto Rico. And you see all these lights? Power generator. That's, that's not the actual electrical system uh, because there was nothing on uh, on September 24 from, from the power company. So it gives you an idea of how, how ba bad things. As a matter of fact, you cannot even see St. Croix on this other picture there after the hurricane. So this is just uh, uh, different, typic, different types of, of electrical towers. They all fail. And again, I, I can give an excuse because they are... So the... This, this is an infrastructure from the 50s and the 60s. So, so the design speeds, and et cetera, and, and the wind design codes were not that strict. So it was expected to happen, but there were all kinds of failures uh, on the transmission towers. And uh, after 10 days, 6% of the power has been restored. And today is 9%, almost a month after that. 
because again, I show you the triangle where, where the economy is and, and the power cannot get there. Uh, uh, but you can see, it looks like a movie of the <laughs> perfect storm. And, and this is in the inner towns. This is even worse because there's a, lo a lot of wooden poles, uh, narrow streets, and, and everything went down. So we, we have good news. The, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers took charge of the recovery of the power grid. And they, now they have, they have a bigger uh, uh, checking account than Puerto Rico. Uh, was, I didn't mention that before. Puerto Rico was bankrupt before the hurricane came in. It had a special oversight committee from Congress to restore the economic agenda of Puerto Rico, but then the hurricane came. And so the, the, the cash flow of the government was non-existent. So who will sign a contract with the government to do a repair? Nobody will. That's a reality. They don't want to talk about that in the news, but that's a reality. So uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers bring their checkbook and because of all the tweeting that goes on on Puerto Rico and stuff, uh, things started moving faster. And um, they have made $400 million in contracts already. And so they, on Friday, they announced a new recovery plan. Originally, they say between six and seven months to have the power back. So the new plan uh, puts uh, um, around, uh, I cannot read it from here, 80% by, by the 1st of December, 95% by the 15th of December. Uh, I am in that 5% that will not be uh, <laughs> by December uh, because by year might never came back, so my guess is. And then I have a power pole in the back of my yard and it fell down. And it only gives power to three homes. So priority for my power pole is about this. So, but, but this is great news, definitely. Great news uh, for, for Puerto Rico. That, uh, it will, most of it will be done in three months. In terms of the road system, this is the roads that were contract to the private sector before the hurricane. So a uh, few days after they were clean for the operation. But as you can see, they just go around the island. They, the, the, they don't go into the central mountain towns. Uh, we have uh, about 34 towns on the mountain. So it, it was a, a terrible situation for, for getting the access. Uh, there were all kinds of failures. Uh, the failures on the bridges Concrete bridges was not due to structural failure, but a failure on the foundations. Uh, two reasons, either, either they were exposed and let the piles uh, be in a situation of, uh, of problems of stability, or um, and others, and other areas where the complete foundation was exposed and the, the protection on the approach slabs and stuff were, were gone with, from the water. I mentioned to you the problems on the main avenues of all the debris that occur, but then because maybe a, a water pipe broke, maybe because the, there was this channelized, the, this river that was channeled before, it broke loose, the, the, and the, the, the channel of the water was broke, so the roads go completely, and then the towns becomes incommunicated. Uh, 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 Bridges were, were blown away because of the failure of the foundation. And this is to show you, you an example of the ingenuity. Uh, this is the town of Utuado. All the bridges accessing the town were lost. So they're st stranded in there. And, and you can see they developed some uh, system to, this is a, a regular uh, supermarket cart, and they would pull it with a pulley to start getting food into the town. It was a complete disaster. And then finally, about eight days after the hurricane, the big uh, army helicopters came in and then they started these missions, uh, flowing in food uh, to the smaller town. This is a typical road failure that we, the, all the central uh, mountains, there's a lot of problem of, uh, of, of landslides because of the extreme and continuous raining. As a matter of fact, there is a, a depression right now over Puerto Rico. It started raining this morning and will be raining until Wednesday. So that's uh, more and more of this will happen. This is an old system of bridges that was developed in the 30s and the 40s. All the bridges performed well. 
but the access to the bridges start falling because of the excess of water. And so it becomes incommunicated. Then this is, you know, we, we, we are, I, I do selfies all the time with my mobile phone. And we are used to do everything with our mobile phones. We buy things, we get the news, we send information. I do the inspections on my project with a program that is called Checklist that I send a report immediately, nothing worked. So for a society that is uh, addicted to the iPhones and the, and the Samsungs, uh, to realize that you don't have that kind of tool, that it took, uh, it took me four days to be able to speak with all my brothers. And there were families that they took them two weeks to be able to speak with their families. Because if you, many people, their parents are from the uh, towns in the mountains, and you live in San Juan or the metropolitan area, and there was no access to, to, the, to the towns, and then there was no communication. And there are still now uh, 44 towns that don't have any kind of mobile signal at this point. So it really doesn't work. And this looks like a zombie movie. It's not. Actually, some of the towers, 5%, remain standing. And once the company started to power up, there was a kind of a communication around the towers. So if people discover that there was a tower working, they would stop their cars whenever they could, trying to, to, to get a signal and be able either to talk with their relatives in the States or trying to talk to their relatives in this. And it, was, it's, it's, it became even terrible because once they started uh, on the main ar areas, uh, putting the, the cells to work. Uh, in the expressways is where you have more open area, so you have more signal. So people started getting message when they were on the expressway, so where they stopped right away because they got a message. And you can see this huge traffic jams, and you can see the people standing on the roofs just trying to get a signal and be able to communicate. It's something that I would have never expected in my life. And we're now, it started to be launched, a project by, that was experimental, the project Looms Balloons from Google, that these are, uh, are balloons that they are over 30,000 feet above, above the ground, and they create a network. And if your mobile company has a signal where you are, the phone will use the, your, your carrier signal. But if you move into an area where you don't have a carrier, it will change to the Google signal. And they expect by the end of the month to have in Puerto Rico cover once they, they, they launch it. They got a, uh, a special permit from FCC. To, to, it's a, an experimental technology. And they got a, a permit, and it hopefully will work and will certainly <laughs> improve the communication inside Puerto Rico. Flooding, this is just a picture of the flooding. It was on the lower areas, you know, was. People lost everything in, uh, in communication. And this, this is one of the major problems that happened in some of the other islands in the Caribbean. When there is a hurricane, there is called what is called the storm surge. In, in Puerto Rico, on the southern part, the storm surge was over 18 feet. In the northern part, was over 12 feet. So when the river tries to come out, the sea level is higher than the than the than the rivers itself. So the river cannot go out with the water, so they, they, they have back water going back into the mainland. So it, it, it creates huge areas of uh, backup water trying to come out and the, the sea preventing it. Um, this is just more images. Uh, it's funny how well designed these uh, mailboxes are there. I'm impressed. <laughs> They should contract these guys to make the cellular phone towers. To <laughs> and then they, because of, the, uh, the, of this backwater, you know, whole urban areas, they were completely communicated. And agriculture, 100% of the crops were lost. No, no coffee, no, no plantains, no anything. There's some numbers that they say it's 20% is working. Uh, it's because uh, dairy farms are... 20% uh, of the agricultural economy in Puerto Rico. And the dairy farms are, are working, even though 
there was a lot of uh, cows that died on the process of the, of the hurricane. But actually, there's no, nothing that grows or survived the hurricane. We only have the dairy farms. Commercial steel buildings, terrible performance, terrible performance. And even the well-designed ones, uh, they, they always lost uh, some of the siding and stuff. And this creates a problem of performance or, or usage of the buildings because once water goes inside, and, and just remember, when the, bl the wind blows in, in, in this kind of wind, 155 miles per hour, you have like a cloud of white stuff. That's water going horizontally everywhere that it can, it can get. Facades, all the windows and, and stuff in the apartments. You can see these uh, families sitting there <laughs> waiting to see how help is going to get to them. Uh, this is a new building, and that I was really surprised. Modern buildings like this losing panels uh, because there's a factor of safety. So it was designed for 135, 155 should be okay. But then again, there was gusset winds reported in San Juan of 200 miles per hour. So, so that's, that's another story. Uh, then this is the worst part of all. Uh, in Puerto Rico, 50% of the housing is constructed in a formal way. Engineers, architects, permits, contractors, etc. The other 50% is done informally. Half of them are concrete houses, so those survive the hurricane. But the other half is wood houses with very little resources. As you can see here, no connections or anything. You can see on this other picture, there's, there's no connectors nor anything. So just the wind blew them away. Estimates run about, uh, uh, and this is the, 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 bad, the bad side. This is our families that they have no chance of helping themselves at this point. Uh, they, they lost their homes, they lost everything they have, any photograph or anything they have from their families, and they are out of work because right now there are over, over 300,000 people uh, displaced out of their work because the, the, the companies are not working, the businesses are not open, so, so that's a, a bigger problem. Uh, the commercial steel buildings, this is a marina, this is a chicken farms, those were destroyed. 1.5 million chickens died during the hurricane. And this is uh, the failures we have found so far in concrete buildings are associated with uh, uh, front, uh, seafront properties that the, the storm surge um, uh, uh, wash away the foundation uh, of the buildings. And then you can see here, the, this is two buildings next to each other. This one is here. Uh, and they failed because there, there was no foundation. The concrete poles, total failures. These ones fall because of foundation problem. They, they made a wrong calculation of what the quality of the soil was, and you have this problem. But here, there was about half of the poles they broke in the middle. Uh, uh, my explanation to that is that above, above certain heights, the poles have holes so that the electric utility can put uh, uh, all their uh, uh, channels and stuff to connect the cables. And as you can see, the poles in use in Puerto Rico doesn't have uh, uh, stirrups or, or, or spirals. So if, if you think that in my home there was over five hours, 125 miles per hour winds, uh, the vibration uh, fatigue the concrete on that joints and, and they, they fail because Typical, typical failure like in concrete columns and in earthquake conditions because you have five hours that pole vibrating there with a sustaining speed. Um, random damages, just, just, you know, a car going around a pole, the, this parking lot, car parking lot, now it's a boat parking lot. Uh, and this is, was terrible, you know. There was no distribution of fuel, little number of gasolines because no power was open. Basically, five to six hours to get your tank full. It was terrible. P people were scared. Uh, there was no gasoline. And then this is people that have personal or portable power generators. They, they make long lines of, to get the, the fuel for the power generators. Uh, and then this was something unexpected. We ran out of actual cash in Puerto Rico. Since no power was working, we, there were no 
no credit card or debit card transactions, so people have to pay by cash. And they have to flew airplanes full of cash to Puerto Rico to distribute it among the banks so that people could actually go and cash a check because there was not enough currency going around the island to, to, to take the crisis, uh, crisis. Which, uh, again, with the distribution, the, the, the food shortage, it, it became terrible. Uh, people could not find anything on the, on the supermarket that were open. The same thing with the water. This is the same bridge I showed you before, but now the army has organized uh, uh, ways of, of putting food inside. So where we are now for closing, and I cannot read it from here. Let me see if I can read it from this. So we have 79% uh, of the gas stations open, 86% of the supermarkets open, 9% of electricity, still sucks, 56% uh, of the telephone service, but this is just telephone service, not that data is still very limited. Uh, 63% of water, uh, definitely in the central mountains, they don't have water because they have to pump it from there, and, and there's no electricity. Uh, in terms of uh, cell phone and tent, only 18% of the population in operation. Uh, the cell towers, 36%, still 108 uh, churches open, it's 5,000 people. Banks, 61% of the banks are out. Uh, so lessons learned. This is my recommendations. Um, the, uh, I, my recommendation would be that uh, every essential facility would have at least one week of, of diesel reserve. Uh, develop an underground um, communication network. It's not acceptable that towns cannot communicate with the government, central government. Increase Puerto Rico code wind design for 175. Uh, increase Puerto Rico code wind design for communications and power facilities to 200 miles per hour. Uh, require ductility in concrete poles. Uh, develop certification programs for windows, doors, and facades, similar to the Miami-Dade County standards, which have worked very well. Uh, require emergency generators in water pumping station with a minimum one-week diesel reserve and eradicate the informal housing construction by providing strict uh, inspection and all type of budget housing. And this is an issue of politics. You know, politicians don't want to get into this, but if we don't want to lose another 200,000 homes, uh, we, we need to go uh, follow that path. So this is the end, and that's the cigar I smoke at 4 p.m. September the 20th after the strong wind hurricane forces have gone from Puerto Rico. Thank you very much.